Welcome back. We're going to be looking at the MVR itself today. Uh, the Zossi MVR that the cameras connect to. So we haven't really looked at this device too much. We've had it powered up before, but we haven't actually tried looking at what it does. Um, just a really quick breakdown of the components. It's got a high silicon SOC underneath here, the Wi-Fi um, chip here. We've also got the external SPI flash. It's designed to be connected to the home network using wired Ethernet. So I'm going to go for that. So all I'm going to do is I am going to plug in the power and the buzzer is going to get very annoying. And we're going to look at Wireshark. Um, so Wireshark is capturing this USB Ethernet adapter to see what traffic is going out over it. It's been configured so that it will give an address to the MVR. So it's acting as a router with DHCP running on it. So immediately in Wireshark, we can see as soon as the adapter comes up, um, Ubuntu will spam out a load of stuff. And then we get ARC requests from when I last booted it. And then we get DHCP. So DHCP, Dynamic Host Configuration Protocol, is the way that most devices on your home network um, will get an IP address. So what we've got here is a packet that's coming from our device going to broadcast, and it's asking for... Um, an IP address. Our router then gives it an offer, so it says you can have um, an IP address. The device requests that IP address and then our router acts it back. So you can see in that last step there we get 10.42.0.85, so that is the IP address of our router. Now nothing else has come through so far, so it's not doing anything in particular. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to port scan it 10.42.0.85 and see what it's got open. So it's got Telnet open on it, and if we Telnet into it, we get a prompt root password nothing, and we're straight in as root. I haven't modified this device, so it, it's running as is, um, and it has a root Telnet shell on it with no password, which is clearly not great. Run PS there, we can quickly see what's going on. Um, it's running a script from MNT MTD, so MTD is Memory Technology Device. Uh, Reboot.sh, we've got a module there, TD3520, so I think that means the chip on that is a um, high silicon 3520. Um, we've got host APD running at the bottom there. That will be the host APD that is uh, offering the Wi Fi service. Um, to the device. So if we do cat mnt mtd wfcfj hostapd.conf there we've got the SSID of the MVR, so the serial number of it, um, along with that WPA fast pass phrase of 1234567A. So that's how it's set up on this end. Um, let's see what else is in, in this directory. So in mnt we have app.sh USB, let's go into MTD and see what's in there. So we've got quite a few files in there. We've got a lot of .sh shell scripts, and again, as a reverse engineer, they're nice and easy to, to read. We've got modules.tar.gzip. It's quite common for these to have the application, uh, the binaries compressed, and they will unpack them into RAM as the device starts up. So looking at mount, the root is a GIFS2 file system, read, write, proc, these aren't too important. So yeah, MNT MTD modules is a tempfs, so essentially it's in RAM. 25 megs, WF configs, 5 megs, and we've got a temp and an NFS directory. So it might be running some form of NFS. Netstat, um, dash UTLP, see what services are listening. Let's make the zoom a little bit lower. There we go, that's better. So we've got just listening on Telnet on TCP. So it's not offering a web service or anything like that, which is unexpected. And we've got UDP listening on one, two, three, oh wait, no. Duplicate port there. Interesting. I wonder why that is. Two duplicate ports. So it's listening on some high numbered ports with UDP. Process 995 TD351020. Um, 
Yeah, so it is, it's this one here, this modules TD3520, so CD modules. So we've got a load of stuff there. Let's see what that TD3520 is. Doesn't have file, that's a bit of a pain. So we could look at that offline and see what's going on with that. How big is that file? So it's a two point megabyte executable. Um, it's gonna be a binary. Um, but not having a file is a bit of a pain there. I wonder if there's any connections gone out since we've started looking at this. So, okay, we've got lots and lots of traffic now. So that was me port scanning it. And that might be the bulk of the traffic, in fact. Well, oh no, okay, there's me telnetting in. Ah, then, then it starts doing its thing. Okay, so a good a good way of seeing what one of these is communicating with is to filter down to DNS. So there we've got a request for all dash master dot platform dot com and shadow dot com. So this is going to be the the IoT platform, the platform that allows us to view this device remotely. Um, so IOTC platform dot com and dvema dot com. So Let's um, start up Firefox and see if either of these offer I can't even remember that domain, what was it? all-master.iotcplatform.com I can't type, can I? So it's not going to work I could have just copied and pasted it, of course. That would have been easier. So the domain there, IOTC platform, exists. A company called ThruTech. Um, can we change the language on this? My understanding of probably Chinese is not great. Um, so who are ThruTech? It's communicating with its IOTC platform. Are they some third party? Is ThruTech actually the person who makes Zossi? Who knows? And the other one was shadow.dvema.com. Oh, Not found. I'll try HTTPS. Did I get that right? Yep, shadow.dvema.com. Okay, let's change that for www. Oh, okay. So we've got a JSON response. Please confirm the request URL, 414. Let's actually see what the device did right after that. So first off, before it's connect communicated with DVMA, we've got lots and lots of um, UDP traffic going to port 10001. So this is kind of a common pattern with these. They use UDP on a high port number. They communicate with a number of different servers. It's really quite awkward working out what's in that packet. Um, it's not a standard protocol. I don't know if anybody's done any work on that. It'd be good to have a look. Then we get shadow.dvma and then we've got some HTTP traffic. So let's do follow stream, HTTP stream. So we're doing get device shadow update etk equals long base 64 string version 1.64 channel cloud vod pwd pwd password possibly qq123456 we get response message code zero message success data so if we copy this url here and then go to Shadow. It's going to be HTTP, of course, and then give it the rest of that. There we go. So we've sent that same request, device shadow update. Now, if we get rid of the end of that URL, do we see any API endpoints? Nope. So it's interesting. So it's communicating with this external server. Google doesn't have anything on that. 
So what is DVEMA? How is this linked to ThruTech and this IOTC platform? Okay, so there's that response I saw before. Ah, so there is something on www. App bar. More error codes, more stuff that I'm not going to understand. So the service terms are not trivial for me to read there. The app bar, how to add DVR devices. So this is another app. Uh, so that's the same logo we saw there, that cloud one, that's the same logo we saw on the Zossi search tool. Um, so might be worth examining what the app's doing next. Uh, one other thing I do want to do is we've got some Base64 data there. Let's just see what's in that. ETK, existing temporal key. I don't know, I'm making this up as I go along. Um, another really cool tool that I use a lot is CyberChef, which is like an online tool um, that allows you to perform basic operations like Base64 decode, AES encrypt, things like that, convert to and from hex. Right, so converting that from Base64 gives us another string there. That I don't recognize again it looks pretty random equals az I'm not really sure what that is so we could start looking at the binary on the device itself to work out how to uh, how this string's built up what dvema is and do we have grep we go up let's see if we can find dvema so grep ri means recursive, case insensitive, and let's see if it will find anything. Now it can be quite slow grepping on devices like these, sometimes they really, uh, I don't know why actually, they really seem to take a long time to search file systems. So yeah, it is a high silicon 3536 it looks like, judging by those file names, lots and lots of modules get loaded. Now of course have I got some kind of structure there that's really not allowing me to Whoops, really not allowing me to search for anything. It's grep broken. That is very slow. Let's see what's in this config.xml. So that looks like, so we've got a username and password there, admin, admin, user, one, two, three, four, five, six. I bet that's for the actual DVR itself. Pusher, different codecs, that's port 50,001 and 50,002, not 10,001 like we've seen before, sample rate. What else have we got here? Boot.sh, let's have a look at that. So this looks similar to what we saw on the camera, so it's loading some, mod well, removing a module, loading a module, something to do with updating it. No need to recovery program from USB, so it can probably recover from USB if you put it into a certain condition. Wi-Fi connect info. Well, we've routed the NVR. That was pretty easy. We're now able to explore what's happening, we're able to intercept that traffic. We've seen the two domains it's communicating with there, dvema.com and that IOTC platform. So we can have a dig there. It might be worth having a Google to see if anybody's done any other work on interacting with these clouds to see what they are. Um, I think probably the next best step is to get this paired up with the mobile application or a Windows application so we can actually interact with the DVR and see what it's doing. I think that's probably the best way. Anyway, sorry these are getting a bit meandering. I don't know where we're going with this, so I'm not sure what the vulnerabilities we're going to find are, what security issues or what we're going to learn. But thanks for watching. I'll be back shortly with another one of these videos. Bye for now.